Now, today, we are going to run through a lot of work. Okay, it's going to be one of those days where I have to speak quite quickly, and you'll probably only really be able to listen to what I say when you go through the video, <laughs> um, because I have to go through it quite quickly. But we're going to be covering the functional systems of the brain. And by functional systems, I'm talking about attention, the visual system, the auditory system, the motor system, the sensory system, uh, pain pathways, vestibular system, gustatory system, olfactory system, memory, and executive functions. Okay, so you can see it's quite a, quite a load to get through. Um, and what we're really trying to understand here today are the, are the pathways, the, the pathways of the neurons that make the, the systems function. Okay. So let's start with attention. There are four different types of attention that is mentioned in your textbooks. You've got focused or selective attention, which is the same as concentration. Sustained attention, which is the same as vigilance. Divided attention and alternating attention. So your focused attention um, is where you highlight one or two important stimuli while suppressing awareness of competing distractions. So, for example, you're reading a book in the library, there are other people around you, other noises around you, but you're blocking them out while you're concentrating. Sustained attention or vigilance is the capacity to maintain an attentional activity over a long period of time. Okay. Divided attention is where the ability to respond to more than one task at a time or to do multiple elements or operations within a task. So that's when you're on the phone and you're busy with your computer while you're um, tidying up your desk, that type of thing. And the alternating attention, which, which allows for shifts in focus and task. So then you're busy looking, concentrating at this, and then you turn your attention to that, and then you turn your attention to this again. All right. When we are um, assessing people, we are watching them to see if they can concentrate for a long time. Okay, so we're watching their ability. We want to see if they get distracted. This is where it's sometimes useful to have an office that is not completely soundproof. I don't think any of us do have soundproof offices. But um, if there is a, somebody coughing outside your door or a car that drives past the, you know, in the road that's noisy, and you notice that your patient gets distracted by that. That's, that's important to note down. Okay, because it talks about their ability to, to focus and um, to concentrate. Sustained attention, we normally test through, for example, our vigilance tests, like our letter cancellation tests, where and you get it in various forms. And um, the, um, the DCAFs has it in one of the forms, where you have this big page, lots of numbers, and you have to cross out all the number threes. Okay, that's one example. Divided attention, how we normally test that is through our trail-making B test, where they have to draw a line from a number to a letter to a number to a letter to a number to a letter. But so they've got to think about this while they're thinking about that. They need to know where they were with the numbers and know where they were with the letters. Okay. And alternating attention, that is really where you notice if you're testing somebody and you've now finished with that test, you go to a new test and you notice they're a bit sluggish to get into that test. And you often see it on your list learning test, like your Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test. If for the first trial, the person does worse than the first trial of their second list, um, then you know that it is probably because they were just struggling to get into this task and that they might struggle with alternating attention problems. Okay. All right. And very importantly, without attention, information will not be stored. It's very important when you've got people coming to you complaining of memory difficulties. You're not going to remember anything if you weren't paying attention to it. Okay. Now, the visual system, just the basics of the eye. All right. Okay, this is, this is the eyeball. Okay, you know, you've got the pupil, you've got the iris, you've got the lens of the eye. The retina at the back here, this is what is important to us, because the retina forms part of the brain. Okay. And that information goes through to the optic nerve and into the brain. Now, how the eyes work and the visual fields and the swapping and the crossing and so on is very complicated. And while you can um, try and work it out each time, you know, if you have a question about, for example, let's say, 
um, somebody has lost vision in the top left visual field, what is wrong with that person's visual tract? Um, well, you can try and work it out each time. I find I should just try to learn it off by heart. It was a little bit easier than trying to work it out each time. But So, for example, let's say this um, is the um, left-sided right lower quadrant. It's green. Okay, so that would go into that area of the retina, the back of the eye, travel along the optic chiasma, um, into the optic radiations, and through to the visual cortex. Different to, for example, let's say this area, which is the right, right eye, left upper quadrant, which gets reflected there, comes along here, comes along there, relays in the right geniculus nucle nucleus, and goes along there and to the visual cortex at the back. <coughs> All right. Now, this here, the optic chiasma, that is where they, they cross. Okay. And if you look in the brain, if you actually open up the brain, it's quite easy to see that structure there. Just to look at it from a slightly different perspective, so light falls onto the photoreceptors at the back of the retina, goes into the optic tract, um, relays in the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, radiates this way through the optic radiations and then into the back, into the occipital cortex. Okay. Now, that is mo what most of us already know about vision, that there are subsystems of the visual system that are very important and become very interesting. So we know, okay, the back of the brain, it has to do with pattern perception, depth perception, color, vision, and tracking of moving objects. The further you are away from this primary occipital area, the more processed the information comes, having to do with depth perception, color vision, and so on. All right. So as information goes in the back of the occipital cortex into the primary occipital cortex, it then gets transferred to and gets processed more. And then we have information that is processed, like pattern perception, depth perception, color vision, and tracking of moving objects. Okay. And those, these areas that process that information, they work completely on their own. So you can have damage to the one, and the others will be intact. Okay. Now, besides our normal <coughs> visual pathway that we know about, we also, um, we also have a, what we call a tectopulvinar pathway. Um, and it takes part in detecting orientation to visual stim stimulation. So this is a pathway that comes along here as normal. Sorry, yeah. Um, but about over here, it relays back to the superior colliculus, and if you remember back back of the brain semi, you have these two little, these four little bumps. The lower ones are inferior colliculus, and the top ones are the superior colliculus. So this is, it um, synapses in the superior colliculus, bends back like this to the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus, and then also to the amygdala. Okay. Now this, these, this is the geniculus striate pathway, and that is the one that we associate mostly with vision. And if there's damage to that, then we have a problem with our vision. But what makes this other little pathway interesting is that you can see it doesn't relay, that pathway doesn't relay to the occipital areas. So it hasn't to have to do with vision as we know it, but it has more to do with blind sight. Now, blind sight, as I think I've mentioned before, is where the person cannot see they're blind. They're effectively blind. However, if you put something in front of them, some people, and you say to them, grab the thing that is in front of you, some people would be able to accurately grab what it is. So there's a part of them that knows where it is, even though they can't see it. And it has to do with this other little pathway. Okay. Now, <clears throat> a different... Um, subsystem is a supra, suprachiasmic nucleus. There is a suprachiasmic nucleus. It has to do with circadian rhythms such as sleep and feeding. 
It's located in the hypothalamus and situated directly above the optic chiasm. Remember, optic chiasm is where the pathways cross. And so the information comes in here, relays to suprachiasmic nucleus. And it, as I said, has to do with your circadian rhythms. And we know that our circadian rhythms are affected by how much light comes into our eyes. So we know whether it's daytime, whether it's nighttime, whether it's winter, whether it's summer, whether it's more light, less light. Now, your long-term circadian rhythms have to do with the pineal gland. So this information comes in through the eyes, through the retina, goes to the suprachiasmic nucleus, goes right down to another ganglion, and then eventually goes up to the pineal gland that sits over there. Okay. Now that has to do with our long-term circadian rhythms. And you probably have heard research that shows that people in, that live in countries where it's dark, much you know, dark a lot of the time, where the days are very short in winter, um, they tend to become more depressed because there's a lack of melatonin in their systems because there isn't enough light going in through the retina. Okay. Now, another visual subsystem is the one that, that changes the sizes of our pupils. Okay. Now, the way that that works is the information comes in as usual along the retina, along the optic chiasm, through to the back here, but then a part of it loops this way and goes back there to the ciliary ganglion and then round the side there to the irises. And here's just a bigger picture of it. So it comes along here to the iris, and of course the iris then controls how big or small the pupil is, depending on whether it's um, shrinking back or filling up the space. The extent which people's pupils dilate and so on has a, is very important for neurology. And if one pupil is dilated and the other one isn't, for example, is a good, in, good indicator of, brain, of traumatic brain injury and so on. Okay. And you know if both pupils are dilated, it's possibly an indication of drug, drug addictions. All right. Okay, another... Um, Subsystem is the superior colliculus. Remember I said you've got these four little bumps at the back of the brainstem? The two of them are the inferior colliculus and then two at the top of the superior colliculus. So here we go. Inferior over there, superior over there. And the superior colliculus has to do with the orientation of your head. So you want to look at something, your head turns towards it. Okay, and that's because of superior colliculus. Then we have the subsystem that involves the accessory optic nucleus. And this is the eye movement that compensates for head movement. So if you're busy, you know, if, if, um, if you turn your head, um, but you, your eyes are keeping still, that, that's called, well, it has to do with the accessory optic nucleus. All right. And the neurologists normally test for this. It's called the doll's eye maneuver, where they take the person's face and they turn their head and they say to him, look at me, and they turn their head. And the person, the normal person, would be able to look at the doctor even while their head's being turned. Okay. But somebody who has ne certain neurological difficulties, their eyes will turn with their head. Okay. The frontal eye fields, if you look at the brain, you know this is the frontal lobe over here. The frontal eye fields are located over there, and they have to do with voluntary eye movements. So, for example, if you're busy reading, your eyes, you, you, you control where your eyes are going. Now, while I'm ta to be talking about these different systems, I'm also going to be talking about what if there's a disconnection between the left and the right hemispheres. To what extent do the pathways cross, and if they cross, where do they cross? Okay, so that's what I refer to when I talk about disconnection. Now, verbal material is more accurately perceived when presented to the right hemisphere and processed in the left hemisphere. Okay. Visuospatial input is more accurately perceived in the left hemisphere and processed in the right hemisphere. Okay. So I think that makes sense. We know the left side is more verbal, the other side is more nonverbal. So let us look at the auditory system. You, I'm sure you're all familiar with the basic structure of the ear, so I'm not going to go into that right now. These are the auditory pathways. 
Information comes in, let's say here through the left ear, to the cochlea, goes to the cochlear nucleus over here. Now watch what happens. Part of the information stays ipsilateral along there. Part of the information swaps over to the other side, to the superior olivary nucleus, goes up to the inferior colliculus. Remember, here, there the in, there's the in, superior colliculus, there's the inferior colliculus, so there's the inferior colliculus. Up to the medial geniculate nucleus, the medial geniculate nucleus is in the thalamus, and then through to the auditory processing cortex, auditory cortex. Okay, so you can see immediately with, that when it comes to hearing, it is ipsilateral as well as contralateral. So the auditory system has both crossed and uncrossed connections. For example, the left hemisphere, hemisphere receives most of its inputs from the right ear, but also receives input from the left ear. So words played into the left ear can travel directly to the left hemisphere or can go to the right hemisphere and then to the left hemisphere through the corpus callosum. The motor system. I know I'm going through these quite quickly, but we, as I said, we have quite a lot to go through. All right. When we think about the motor system, we've got to think about the basal ganglia. So, and you know that this is the basal ganglia. It's a picture of the basal ganglia. There's one on the left, on the right. This pinkish part here is the thalamus. Okay. Now, damage to the part to the basal ganglia can lead to problems like uh, Huntington's career, Parkinson's disease, and Tourette's syndrome, which are all motor control sort of problems. Um, the motor area, this is the primary motor cortex, and the premotor cortex is obviously very important. And disturbance of motor functions would lead to fine, fine movement difficulties, speed and strength difficulties, movement programming problems, problems with voluntary gaze, corollary, corollary discharge. That is when, um, if you're moving, let's say you're driving in a car, let's say you're driving on the back of a back key or something, it's bumping up and down, your world is still standing still, even though your whole body is going up and down. Okay, that's because of corollary discharge and speech. The problem, why you would have problems with speech is if, if you think of where Broca's area is, okay, it's over there. Broca, one of the difficulties with Broca's area is that it involves the motor areas, where speech is also a motor difficulty, a motor, a motor process. Okay. All right. Now, disconnection of the motor system, um, which side works with what and where do they cross and so on. The motor system has crossed connections and they cross in the brainstem. Okay. So... If you have, for example, a stroke on the left-hand side over there, it's the right side of your body that will be affected. I think that's fairly straightforward. Now, there are different things that can go wrong with a motor system. Um, apraxia is one of them, which is the inability to carry out purposeful movements on command in the absence of paralysis or other motor or sensory impairments. So if a person has a paralysis on one side, then you're not going to say they're apraxic. Apraxia is only if their, motor, if their motor abilities are intact, but they have difficulty carrying out purposeful movements on command. Okay. Myasthenia gravis is, refers to when there's severe muscle weakness, and sometimes you see it in the face if there's, for example, a droopy eyelid. It might be due to myasthenia gravis. Poliomyelitis is an infectious <coughs> illness that affects the motor neurons. That's why people lose strength in their legs and so on. And multiple sclerosis, because myelin is lost in the neuron, wrapped around the axon. Of course, other difficulties with motor systems is if a person becomes a paraplegic or quadriplegic. Paraplegia is if there's spinal damage, and approximately that area over there. Quadriplegia is if there's spinal damage higher up so that the, motor, the messages from the brain cannot reach the motor areas of the body. Then we have an interesting brown saccade syndrome. You don't pronounce it like that. I actually looked it up to see how you pronounce it. It's very French, and I can't pronounce it. So I'm just going to call it the brown saccade syndrome. 
Very interesting knee. It um, happens as a result of a unilateral section through the spinal cord. So unilateral, only one side of the spinal cord is damaged. And what then happens, let's say the damage to that area over here. You have loss of pain and temperature on the one side, and on the other side you have paralysis of movement and loss of proprioception and vibration. Okay. Now proprioception, just so you know, is your body awareness, such as muscle strength, whether your tendons are stretched, joint movement. You're always aware of where our limbs and body parts are because of proprioception. Now, you will read in the Colburn Wishaw book, they talk quite a lot about um, the, the effect of internal images and external images on motor movement. And there's actually been research that's been done to show that, let's say you're a, let's say you're a sports person, let's say you're a dancer or you're a high diver, um, but you do something that requires very precise movements. Thanks, Paul. So if you're a sports person that tends to do a sport that requires very precise movements like dancing, ice skating, um, high diving, that kind of thing, um, research has shown that if the person stands just before they're about to go and do this, let's say, let's say it's a gymnast, just before they do their performance, if they rehearse what their movements in their minds before they go and do it, they do it much better than somebody who didn't rehearse it. So even as you're visualizing your movements, it's actually influencing how the, the, the motor system. Okay. Which is different to imagining somebody else doing ice skating. It doesn't affect your motor movements. And this has implication for, for example, athletes as well as musicians. You know, if you you can actually practice piano without sitting in front of a piano if you can practice the movements. Okay. Now, the sensory systems. There are four major somatosensory submodalities. The ventral tract from the spinal cord to the brain, which is responsible for nociception, which is the perception of pain and temperature. The dorsal tract from the spinal cord to the brain. Remember, if you look, if you cut, if you take a section through the spinal cord, it looks like this. Okay, the ventral horns are in the front here. The dorsal horns are in the back. Okay, so if you talk about the ventral tract from the spinal cord to the brain, it's the tract that runs through the front here to the brain. And if you're talking about the dorsal tract, it's the one that runs at the back to the brain. Okay. Now, the dorsal tract is responsible for hapsis, which is fine touch and pressure, such as flutter, vibration, and steady skin indentation. And proprioception, which, as I said, is body awareness, such as muscle stretch, tendon stretch, and joint movement. And then there's a system for the receptor system in the inner ear that has to do with balance. The somatosensory pathways are the ones that you, you it's how you sense, it's some, you know, if you've touched something, if you can feel something. And let's say something happens, you feel something on your hand, it travels all along this little neuron. Look how long this neuron is. This is one neuron. Okay. It synapses in the spinal cord. And if you look at this picture over here, it goes here, through the spinal cord, up there, in the spinothalamic tract. Um, but higher up, it goes through the reticular formation in the brain stem, and then to the somatosensory cortex. Okay. It relays in the thalamus, of course. Almost everything relays in the thalamus. Now, the somatosensory system is crossed. So sensations of touch in the left hand travel to the right hemisphere and vice versa. Here's an example of somebody who has contralateral neglect. Uh, well, here. A normal person would draw it like this. But this is, sorry, this is actually the model from which the person drew it. So they were asked to draw this, and they drew that. They were asked to draw this, and they drew that. They were asked to draw this, and they drew that. This is a person with contralateral neglect. Okay. People like this also tend to ignore the left side of their bodies. So they'll walk to a door and knock their hand on the, on the side of the door, that kind of thing. Okay. Now let us look at the system of pain. 
have a look here. Now, this, the, you have different pathways, whether it's if for fine touch, proprioception, and vibration, compared to pain, cold, warmth, tickle, and itch. Okay. So for fine touch, proprioception, and vibration, it comes along here. You've got receptors for fine touch, proprioception, and vibrators. It comes into the spinal cord over here to the posterior column. Here's your first neuron going up to here. Synapses there in the nuclei of medulla. Crosses over. Here's your second neuron going through, up, up, up to the medial lemnosus. This is now in the brain stem. Up, up, through, and synapses there in the thalamus. Here's your third neuron going from there to the primary somatic area of the cerebral cortex. Okay. Pain, cold, warmth, tickle, and itch comes through here. Here's your first neuron. Synapses there, pretty much the same. But here it crosses over to the lateral spinothalamic tract. Through there, through there. Here's your second neuron. Through there, through there. Synapses in the thalamus and then through to the primary somato sensory area. Now, why I want to just bring your attention to pain is because the ascending pathway and the descending pathway are slightly different. So your ascending pain pathway goes up here. There are actually two pathways. One goes to the parabrachial area up to the amygdala. I think we can all understand that the amygdala would be involved if there's pain, because the amygdala has to do with fear. So we'll probably get a bit frightened if we get hurt for good reason. The other one goes and it goes into the thalamus and then to the smarter sensory area of the cortex. But coming back, coming back from the amygdala and from the hypothalamus, it goes to what is called the peri periequiductal gray. Now, the periequiductal gray, peri means around, <coughs> aqueduct, around the aqueduct, and it's gray matter. Okay, it's gray matter around the aqueduct. Um, travels down there and then through the rostroventral medulla, descending eventually to the muscles that are going to either, for example, pull your arms away from something hot that you just touched. Okay. Now let's look at the vestibular system. The, you, you know that this is a cochlea, okay? The cochlea br branches out into the auditory nerve. You'll learn more about that as you read up more on the auditory system, okay? But what we're focusing on here are the semicircular canals, okay? These are the semicircular canals that send messages that eventually go to the vestibular nerve. Now, this is looking closer at the, the semicircular canals. The vestibular organs contain hair cells. If you take a little section out of this part here, you look at it there, it has these little hair cells that bend when the body moves forward or when the head changes position relative to the body. And these little, it's these little hair cells that pick up movement. Now, this one here picks up a roll. Now, I like this picture because it explains it so well. If you think of an airplane that's rolling like this, okay, so this little canal will pick up that movement. This one over here will pick up the yaw, what they call the yaw, which is sort of moving, moving like that, okay? And this one here will pick up what they call pitch, which is that sort of movement. All right, so have a look at that, and um, it will just remind you of these various semicircular canals. So you can understand why there are semicircular canals on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and on the z-axis. Okay. The gustatory system has to do with taste. Now, our children are still being taught at school, well, at least mine are, were, that the tongue has these different areas, some for sweet, some for sour, some for bitter. It's actually not true. Um, if you, and you'll read this in Colvin Weschel, each little taste bud has its own little senses for sweet, sour, bitter, um, all the different tastes. So this is what your little, here's the surface of the tongue over there. This is what the little taste bud looks like, or the gustatory taste cell. And the information goes here into the supporting cell, oh sorry, into here, into the sensory nerve fiber, into the brain. So you can see, like this one has, is for sweet, that one's for bitter, that one's for salty or for sour. Okay, so the idea that we have different areas of our tongues responsible for taste is actually a myth. So we've discovered. Okay. 
Now, the information coming from those neurons go along the glossopharyngeal nerve as well as the facial nerve. They synapse in the medulla oblongata of the brainstem and synapses again in the thalamus because almost everything relays in the thalamus and then through to the gustatory cortex, which is in the insula. It's that area there. If you take the brain, you pull it open on the side there. There's that cortex inside there. That is the insula cortex, and it's our primary gustatory area. Okay. The olfactory system. The... Here's a picture of the, the, the nose, the smell system. Here's your nasal passage. Here's your olfactory bulb that the information from there goes onto the olfactory tract, which goes to the cerebral cortex. Okay? But you have these little fibers growing through here, little neurons growing through here, into the nasal passages, picking up on the chemicals of the foods that you've been eating, or not only the foods that you've been eating, because you know that there's a big connection, there's a big gap, really, between the back of our noses and our mouths. Now, when we eat, the, the, the particles from the food also goes to our nasal passages and gets picked up, and that is part of... So it's not just the smell of the food that we smell, but also our nasal passages have to do with the taste as well, and together they form what we call flavour. But, of course, also if you smell something directly, then it's these, part, these little neurons that pick up on smell. The skull bone here has these little holes in them called the cribriform plate that the little neurons grow through. Now, here again, here, here are your little neurons. They go into the olfactory bulb, into the olfactory tract. Have a look here. It goes into, it goes through to the amygdala, which is why we say smell has a very emotional component to it. When you smell something familiar to you, you can have very strong emotional reactions to it. It might be something that makes you so happy or makes something that makes, makes you feel frightened or um, disgusted. And, of course, relaying into the entorhinal cortex and then into the hippocampus. So hippocampus, hippocampus we always associate with memory. We have, tend to have very good memory for smells and particular smells that have an emotional, strong emotional component to them. Now, have a look over here as well. There's a synapse there, and then it goes through here to the, through the anterior commissure. Now, remember, the corpus callosum isn't the only part of the two hemispheres that are, where, where the two hemispheres are joined, also at the anterior commissure. So now, information from the olfactory tract crosses through the anterior commissure to the other hemisphere. Okay. This is just a picture, just to remind you that smells coming into the nose goes to the, to the um, amygdala, it goes to the limbic area, meaning that it has an emotional component to it. Now, the olfactory system is not crossed. Okay, we know many of our systems are crossed. The olfactory system is not crossed. So input from the left nostril goes straight to the left hemisphere and vice versa. Input from the left, right nostril goes straight through to the right hemisphere. But fibers traveling through the anterior commissure join the olfactory region, region. So eventually that information does get to the other hemisphere, but it's through the anterior commissure. But the system is not crossed. Okay. Now looking at memory, we have many different types of memory, and I'm really just going to gloss over this. There's a lot more detail in your book that you can read up on. But basically we have our sensory memory, which is for information less than about one second that we're aware of. Our short-term memory, our working memory, which is less than about one minute. And our long-term memory, which is there for a long time, okay, <coughs> even a lifetime. And of the different types of long-term memory, you get explicit memory, which is conscious, and implicit memory, which is unconscious. Of your explicit memory, you get declarative memory for facts and events, and they are divided into episodic, episodic memory, 
which has to do with personal things, personal events and experiences in your life. I always think of episodic memory like an episode of some other soapy. It's personal. You remember the episode of when your best friend got married. You remember the episode of your 21st birthday. Okay. Episodic memory. It's personal experiences. Compared to semantic memory, which is your memory for facts and concepts, um, remembering that, you know, who the first president was and um, um, which road you need to take to get to um, some other important place. Okay. Your implicit memories are unconscious, and um, they are your also called procedural memory, and they are your memory for skills and tasks, such as how to ride a bicycle, how to um, drive a car. These are things that are not easily lost because they are procedural, they're skill memories. So if you learn to drive, ride a bicycle as a child and you haven't ridden a bicycle for 20 years, it won't take you long to get used to riding a bicycle again once you get back on a bicycle. We tend to not forget things of procedural nature. Now, I have dealt with this in a previous tutorial, but I just want to go through it again. Post-traumatic amnesia is very important to neuropsychologists because it is a very good predictor of extent of traumatic brain injury. Um, and it usually correlates with a Glasgow coma scale. It usually lasts about four times longer than unconsciousness, than your loss of consciousness. So if the person was unconscious for about half an hour, then they're probably going to have a post-traumatic amnesia for more or less two hours. Okay, that's a very rough estimate. And post-traumatic amnesia may be more reliable for determining severity of concussion or brain injury than your Glasgow Coma Scale. And as I said, I have mentioned this before. Um, difficult with Glasgow Coma Scale is the person might have been sedated, the person might have had um, some sort of, you know, they might have been intoxicated. Um, and also the people t noting the Glasgow Coma Scale are not necessarily doing it accurately. So it is a very helpful tool, but you need to understand its limitations. Post-traumatic amnesia, unfortunately, we often actually don't know how long that period of post-traumatic amnesia was. But if we did have a measure of it, it is much more accurate in predicting the extent of traumatic brain injury than the Glasgow Coma Scale. And, but one way that you can try to determine it, if it's years after the accident, is you ask the person, when is the first time that you were aware of what had happened, that you realized you'd been in an accident and where you are? And people normally remember that because it's quite a shock, and we remember things that are emotionally powerful. So they normally remember where they were. They wouldn't know what date it was, and they wouldn't know how long it was after the accident. But they would remember where they were and possibly who was with them. So if you then compare it to the medical notes, then you can see, okay, they were they work up, for example, in a step-down facility, and you know, according to the medical notes, that was a whole week after the accident. Then you know that was a severe traumatic brain injury. But possibly they work up at the scene of the accident. They were aware of whether they were in the scene of, at the scene of the accident. And if you look at ambulance reports, you'll get an idea of how long they were there. Or they work up in the ambulance, or they work up, work up in the emergency um, unit of the hospital. And then you look at how long was it after the accident, and it gives you some idea of the extent of the brain injury. So a post-traumatic amnesia of less than five minutes, which is, for example, if they realize where they were and they were at the accident scene, it's probably very mild. Five to 60 minutes, that's maybe if they work up in the ambulance or possibly maybe at the emergency services, depending on how long it took them to get there, could be mild. Between one and 24 hours would be moderate. So if, for example, they indicate that they only woke up and they had already been moved out of hospital and maybe even discharged home, and it's more than a day after the accident, probably looking at moderate. One to seven days, severe. One to four weeks, very severe. More than four weeks, very severe. Extremely severe. Okay. And here's just a table of how Glasgow Coma Scale relates to post-traumatic amnesia relates to loss of consciousness and whether it's mild or moderate or severe. And there's a subjective component to this assessment. You need to do the judgment to the best of your ability with the information that you have in mind. 
knowing that somebody else might disagree with you, but as long as you are, have a reason for why you say the person has moderate or severe or mild traumatic brain injury, um, then, then that is fine, because then you can then argue it in court if it comes to court. All right. Now, executive functions. We know that executive functions we associate with the frontal lobe. It's not only in the frontal lobe, or, or let's put it this way. You can have damage in other areas of the brain and still have executive dysfunction. For example, there's a very strong link between the frontal lobe and the cerebellum. So if you have cerebellar damage and no frontal lobe damage, you can still have dis-executive dis -executive function because of the pathway that's been damaged. Okay. Now, we associate executive functions with in initiation and spontaneity, planning, strategy formation, purposes, purpose of action, self-monitoring, and inhibition. Now, you, the frontal lobes are from here. This whole area is your frontal lobes. Here's your primary motor area. Here's your premotor area. Here are the frontal eye fields, as I've mentioned before. Here's Broca's area. And this area over here is the prefrontal area, okay, prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is the area mostly associated with executive function, and um, the, it is broken into areas of its own. Now, you get the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is this area here. Dorsal meaning top, lateral meaning on the outside. So it's the areas on the outside at the top of the brain here, okay. And it is mostly associated with working memory, fluid intelligence, and fluency, like verbal fluency and non-verbal fluency, like design fluency. Okay. So working memory, we know that we, we test working memory by um, things like the trail making B test. There are various ways that we can test working memory. Digit span backwards is a test of working memory. So if a person has problems with that, they probably have damage in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, mo many of our tests that test fluid intelligence, um, like the Raven's progressive matrices, um, is also because of functioning in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And then, as I said, if you test fluency, if you test verbal fluency, you're testing the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And if you're testing design fluency, you're testing the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay. I normally quite like to test verbal fluency and design fluency because if there's a problem with both, there's quite strong evidence that there was prefrontal damage. If there was only, pro uh, only a problem with one and not with the other, then you're looking at a much more focal area of damage. Okay. Now, the orbitofrontal cortex is this area just above the eyes. If you imagine, the eyes would be more or less there, okay? So that's why it's above the orbits. That's why it's called the orbitofrontal area. And it is... How is it, it is involved with processing of olfactory stimuli, which would make sense because the olfactory bulbs run just over there, just under there. Okay. So if you had to turn the brain upside down, you'd be looking at, and you're looking at the frontal areas, you're looking at the orbitofrontal areas, and you'll see little olfactory bulbs and olfactory tracts running there. I'm hoping to arrange a brain dissection session so that you can actually go and see it for yourself. Okay. All right. Now, the medial side of the brain, if you had to take the brain, split it open, the parts on the inside of the hemispheres, called the medial areas. Now, the medial prefrontal areas are divided into the superior medial prefrontal and the ventromedial prefrontal. So the superior is more there and the ventromedial more over there. Okay, now, the superior medial prefrontal cortex, including the anterior cingulate, Here's the anterior cingulate there. Look, here's your corpus callosum. The gyrus running just above the corpus callosum is a cingulate gyrus. And the cingulate gyrus is in part of our limbic system, is part of, our, part of our emotional functioning. So the anterior cingulate is part of the superior medial prefrontal cortex. So it, we know immediately that somehow it will have something to do with emotions. Okay. So damage in that area affects drive and affective integration social and emotional behavior, drive and motivation, sexual interest, and then very interesting, what is called default mode network, network which is self-focused cognitive processes like self-awareness, autobiographical <coughs> memory retrieval, mind wandering, future thinking, 
and you'll read in the LISAC that there's done, been some very interesting research done that if a person is actively involved in something, an activity, let's say busy solving a puzzle, this area, the default mode network area, quietens, stops firing. But the moment the person's not doing anything, that area fires up. So if, we just, if we're busy with an active task, then we're not self-thinking of ourselves and pondering about how we fit into this world and where our life is going and so on. But the moment we're not doing something that requires sort of focused attention, then we tend to, we mull over things and we think, we think about our future and where I fit in in this world and my relationships with people, we daydream. It, that's, it's our awareness of ourselves. Okay. The ventromedial prefrontal has more to do with impulse control, maintenance of set and ongoing behavior, planning, judgment, decision making, foresight, empathy. These are our, I think a lot of the patients that have damage in the ventromedial prefrontal areas end up by psychiatrists. They are, are typically a problem, people with behavioral problems. They're impulsive. Um, they, they lack empathy, they injured somebody, they you know, don't really have no remorse for it, um, they're bad with judgment, they're bad with decision making. Um, they are people who typically have damage in this ventromedial prefrontal area. And this is important for us because uh, particularly with people with traumatic brain injury from motor vehicle accidents, as I've mentioned before, People, when you have a high acceleration, deceleration accident, the head goes forward, the brain hits the front of the skull and scrapes against the little bones that are at the bottom here. So it's quite typical for people with brain injury as a, re as a result of motor vehicle accident or high impact accidents to have this kind of problem, some more than others. Problems with planning ahead, judgment, impulsivity, <coughs> are almost always test for that in some way. Because, and, and of course you watch the person as well. Your clinical observations are very important in this regard. And so the, those are all the systems that I've covered today. I wanted to also do left versus right hemisphere, how they are different structurally, and male versus female dif brains, how they're different structurally. But I realize I'm actually not going to get through all of this and that as well. So I've left that for another tutorial. You can see there's quite a bit to read today, but it probably looks a lot worse than it is. Some of it you've already been through if you've been following, if you've been up to date with the reading. Some of it you would have already done, like the um, chapter 16 of the frontal lobes. You'll just, I just recommend that you just go over it again, thinking about it in this light. And there's only one full chapter that you need to go through that is new. The rest are really little bits here, little bits there, little bits there. That will hopefully help you to put it all into the right perspective.